home. This is my library study. It's uh, a lot of guys call it their man cave, but I spend uh, almost all of the time with my wife here, so it's somewhat her cave too. But it's my wonderful room for making the, the fireside chat each week. It's great to be with you. This is completely unscripted, as probably <laughs> becomes clear on occasion. And it's my way of just getting to talk to you about what's on my mind without having to do a whole uh, video at PragerU and also taking at least half the time taking your questions. And that's a big, uh, a big part of it to me and a really important part. So I don't, uh, I don't talk about uh, much of the news. I have a three-hour radio show every day. I get a chance to do it there, although even then I talk about a lot of things. But especially here, I don't feel that that's what I should be talking to you about unless there's something really dominant. I like to talk to you about life, about what matters to me, about what I would hope matters to you. So I'm going to talk to you today about something that seems much lighter uh, than often, but in fact, I, I take it very seriously. And it's uh, the subject of having a hobby or having hobbies. I will concentrate on one in particular since I was a teenager. In fact, I remember I started, I don't even think I was a teenager. I think I was about 11 or 12 when I first got a camera. It was a really, uh, it was really primitive <laughs> when I think about it. It's a Kodak box camera, I think. And I, I fell in love with the idea that I could take pictures because I can't draw to save my life, but I wanted to do something visual that I did. And so I fell in love with photography at about the age of 11 or 12. My dad, may he rest in peace, uh, would take me to Kennedy Airport. I, I, I grew up in Brooklyn. He would take me to the airport, and it was amazing what I did because it was another passion. I had passions at a very early age. I want to talk to you about passions because it's really an important part of happiness. So he would take me to the airport, and I would just go from terminal to terminal and take pictures of airplanes. I didn't take pictures of people at that time. At 12, it didn't interest me to take pictures of people. I wish I did. I did, excuse me, I took family, but I mean random people. Today I love taking pictures of people, and I don't take pictures of airplanes, to be honest. But anyway, that's what I would do. I spend the day at the airport, he would pick me up and take me home. Then, of course, we had the film developed. There was film, not, not what we have today, instant picture, obviously. And then, uh, at about 13 or 14, I started taking pictures of family members. And here's the interesting thing. If it weren't for me... At 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and so on, we would have almost no pictures of my whole extended family. I didn't realize it then, but I was the family photographer. It's not like today, everybody has a camera because of the phone. So everybody said, you know, there are millions of pictures taken a day. But prior to that, people, you know, took very few pictures comparatively, very few. And that's why you don't have many pictures of your grandparents, let's say. That you're there. They might have a wedding picture or, or something else or a few others. But anyway, I took pictures of the family. And I'll tell you one other thing I took pictures of. My mother was the director of a nursing home. She ran a nursing home. And I would go every Christmas to take pictures of the patient's or the, the residents, if you will, the residents of the nursing home. And I took slides. A lot of you don't even know what slides are, I'll bet. Do, do you know what slides are? Well, you two would. But I don't think, would you say most of your generation would know what a slide? No, they wouldn't know. So slides were, uh, you would take a picture, and then it would come back to you in a, in a little cardboard, uh, tiny, thin cardboard. You'd put it in a projector, and you project it on a wall or a screen. So you saw a big picture instead of just a little one in your hand. You saw a very, very big picture. It filled the whole screen. So I only took slides. That's what I did, color slides. So I would take pictures at my mother's nursing home of the residents there. And then I'd come back the next Christmas and I would show the people the pictures from last Christmas. And I remember it was really 
eerie a little bit. The uh, calm, I guess that's the best word, with which they would react to seeing people from the previous year who had died in, during that year. And they go, oh, yeah, there's Harry. Oh, yeah, yeah, he died in April. And it was so, it was it was a little disconcerting for this, this kid that I was, the uh, matter-of-factness with which they regarded death uh, or at least in the way they described it. But but anyway, it was a very wonderful thing. I felt good that I brought them joy. They loved it. They they just went crazy looking at pictures of themselves and of each other. So that's what I did every year, Christmas time for uh, for my mother's nursing home. And I I really got into taking to taking these pictures. And I'm glad I did because as I said, I wouldn't have pictures of of. Uh, many of the relatives that I that I took pictures of at the time, and I got into everything, you know, to learn about exposure and speed, and what we now call ISO was then ASA speed of film. So, what I want to tell you, so I got a new camera. I this is what I've done my whole life. I would I always bought the best camera available at the time for the money that I had. And then a new model would come out, which was better. I would trade in the previous one. I would keep the box so that I get, you know, look really great shape. And that's what I've done my whole life. I've just traded in almost every year or most every two years for a new camera that was a little better than the previous one. And because I just like the variety of it. So I, I, I love it. Now, I want to tell you a little bit before I get into cameras. I want to tell you a little bit about my happiness theory, one of my many happiness theories. Uh, in case you didn't know, I did write a book on happiness, and it's, I, I am told that it, is, it helped a lot of people. I got a letter from a Chinese woman in China, China a Chinese woman in China, not a Chinese-American, who re- reads English, read the book, and I was told by her friend that I do know, who married an American and lives in, in, in America, that it prevented her from committing suicide. I was, I was really overwhelmed and, and, and obviously happy. So the book is called Happiness is a Serious Problem. I'm not trying to sell you a book, but I'd be a little silly if I didn't tell you about it, especially since I do think it could help you a lot. So in it, I, I, I note that the more passions you have, the happier a person you will be. And I worry about the lack of hobbies compared to when I was a kid, when, you know, there were kids who made model planes and model boats, and and there were others who uh, uh, got a shortwave, who got a, uh, it was was shortwave, but who got a, a broadcasting license that you'd have to learn Morse code, and then you could talk into a microphone, and you could then speak to people all over the world. Uh, people loved it. I was a shortwave radio listener. I didn't bother learning Morse code, so I didn't broadcast, which is ironic since I've been broadcasting much of my life. But I didn't. Anyway, the the number of hobbies uh, was, was you know, kid, uh, other kids would build electronic stuff. They'd build radios uh, and other electronic things. But today, because it's all, partially it's all like automated. See, even now, how many... How many young people uh, have uh, photography as a hobby? See, it's not a hobby to take a picture with a phone. You take a picture with with your phone because you want a snapshot of, uh, totally understandably, of, you know, the friends you're with or a selfie of yourself and somebody else. I mean, I I take thousands and thousands of selfies a year with other people's cameras, you know, or other people's phones. Uh, who meet me at airports or at speeches. So I, I am well aware of the selfie phenomenon, and I have nothing against it. I'm not anti. I take pictures with my phone, too, if I if I don't have a camera with me. But it's not a hobby. Y- you just look, and you press a button, and it's over. But when the hobby is to create something particularly beautiful, for example, a portrait of somebody where... You zoom in with your lens and you make the background blurry so that the person stands out. 
that's that's a part of photography that that is that is the art of it that's fun that's exciting that's creative the the the, ca- the phone isn't creative the phone registers a phenomenon and and it, and they they take often very beautiful pictures there's no question about that but it's not comparable to what you could do with a camera so i just got one in the past 2 weeks uh, i traded in a fuji i got a canon I, uh, this is, I'm in love with this camera, the, the, the results, uh, we're going to show you what, we'll, you'll see some of the results and I'm, I'm, I'm not even adept at this camera yet. I'm still learning it, but, but it'll give you an idea of, of what you can do, uh, with, with a camera and you can't do any of that. You, you can't do that, uh, with, with a, uh, with a phone, obviously. And certainly you can't do anything. You can't bring people in closer. You can with a telephoto or a zoom lens where it's like a telescope on your camera. So you bring in things three times closer, five times closer, even 10 times closer. Uh, if you go to a zoo, uh, there's no comparison what you will get with your phone or what you would get with a telephoto lens. You could get a close-up of a lion. It's, it's very different from the lion you know, and, 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 you know, the lion takes up a little part of the picture and the rest is, you know, the, the cage or the, the, the trees that surround the lion. It, it, there's no comparison. So I, I recommend to you strongly to take up a hobby and a, a hobby, you see, it's, you can't say video games. I know video games, video games are a pastime, but they're not a hobby. Uh, at least not in my view, because it's it's a game. Now, what is the difference between a game and a hobby? Obviously, you know, one could debate this, I guess, forever. But the creativity that is available in a hobby is not the same as the creativity. I mean, taking, you know, it's a hobby to play a musical instrument. That's another thing. This is before my generation, even. Every American home for much of American history, that could have any money at all, had a piano. Because, first of all, people couldn't listen to music. They had to play it. See, what's happened is, with with automation, people stopped having hobbies. Why did people have pianos? Because if they didn't have a piano, there was no music in the home. But, of course, there's music in the home now. There's music you put in earbuds, and you can hear any any type of music from anywhere on Earth. And that's great. I do that too. But who's making music? It's very th- big difference between listening and making. And every school uh, taught, or almost every school, would teach musical instruments or had an orchestra. I, I know when I was a kid, you know, older people would say, well, when I was a kid, and, you know, you'd think, okay, when you were a kid, I know you walked five miles to school barefoot in the snow. You know, it's like it's sort of a joke how we had it really tough. My point is not that we had it tough. My point is that inevitably uh, 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 inventions have made hobbies sort of extinct, made these passions extinct, so the room for your creativity is just, it's just been minimized. And I, I feel bad, actually, because the joy that you get, I, the joy, I get a joy with a new camera or the, the same camera taking pictures, as, just like I did, I have to admit, when I was 15. To be excited about good stuff is... A blessing to your happiness but you need to work on what excites you you can't wait for life to excite you you have to start things to excite you to excite yourself and that makes for a happier person uh, I am convinced that uh, part of the reason there are many it's very complex I know but part of the reason for the the appeal of drugs uh, is that uh, people aren't excited by life. If you're excited by life, you, you, you don't need to escape it. You don't want to escape it. Life itself is so exciting. But a lot of people can't say life is exciting. 
And for those of you uh, who were raised in homes, and I know parents are well-meaning here, but they make a terrible error, where everything is school. Everything is school. You know, get great grades or get into a great college. I already did one of these uh, uh, fireside chats on, it doesn't matter where you go to school. This is one of the worst uh, destructive beliefs that you devote your, 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 your holy youth to getting into a good college. So what? So you're, even if you're a great student, does that, does that mean you're excited about anything other than getting good grades? Does it mean you're even excited by the subjects? Even when I was a kid, I remember where uh, kids would uh, study very hard, but they didn't read outside of school. They weren't excited by the subject. They were excited by getting a great grade. But that's not the same thing as excited by learning. Learning in school, Mark Twain in the 19th century, the great, brilliant American humorist and, and uh, novelist, Mark Twain said, I never let school interfere with my education. What a great line. I loved it as a kid because that's how I felt about schools. I never did any homework in high school. It drove my parents crazy, I admit it. But instead of homework, I took a musical instrument. I even told myself how, how to read uh, scores, and I ended up conducting orchestras as an adult. Uh, it's not my profession, but it, but I'm good enough for it to be a passion and, 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 a, and a hobby. The orchestras think I'm good enough. That's why they bring me, and I, and I do fundraisers as a conductor for the orchestras. So what has happened is uh, technology, that's the word, not invention, technology has killed passion in so many arenas has killed creativity and and it's it's not made people happier i mean obviously it's made us happier in the sense that life is so much more convenient i thank god for technology and, and i'm on i'm on the cutting edge of it i follow it i i i i love it without the internet you wouldn't see me if it weren't for technology <laughs> I, I talk to people around the world thanks to technology i love technology but that's not the same as a hobby or a passion or something to excite you. So I, I invite you to take up one, including getting a camera and learning it. But who reads instruction manuals, right? But you don't even have to anymore. You go on YouTube and you, you watch somebody teach you how to use that camera. I do. I do both the manual and I watch people. And it's a lot of fun. And I, I, I fear that the, the, the camera will go only to professionals and everybody else will just use their phone. And it's, it's a loss. So whether it's a musical instrument or it's, or it's a camera, one time I'll talk to you about fountain pens. I mean, I, I'm lucky. I'm a happy guy. And a big part of my happiness uh, is that I get excited about a lot of stuff. But I tell you, you could teach yourself to get excited. It comes naturally, and I'm lucky. That's my nature. But it's also something I've pursued. So watching movies, watching videos, watching, watching, the very word watching. And I understand the appeal of watching. But watching isn't the same as creating. That's the difference. So I invite you to consider it. So I'll take a picture of you right now. Now you got to focus, and you got to create, and you got to know what you want to focus. It's fun. Okie dokie. All right, time for you to, uh, for your questions. Rosen, 31 years old, Sofia, Bulgaria. Hello from Bulgaria. Hey, did I, have I ever mentioned how much I like Bulgarians? On the, on, on this? Um, have I done it on the fireside chat? A little. Well, I, I've been to 130 countries. Bulgarians remain uh, one of my favorite people interestingly enough i found them to be i found you folks to be a, a lot of nice a lot of nice folks in bulgaria i mean every country has nice people and bad people just that's the way it is but i think some countries have more nice people than others how could it not be culture is very important anyway i have a very warm feeling toward you 
Hello from Bulgaria, Dennis. How do you explain the consequences of socialism and communism to people from an ex-communist state like Bulgaria? They're supposed to know it's bad, but they like it. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm stymied by this too, just as you are. In Russia, they actually are, uh, are telling pollsters how much they like Stalin. Stalin murdered tens of millions of their fellow citizens, innocent people, murdered. It almost doesn't mean anything. It's a tragedy. If I say so, one person is murdered and you know them, your heart breaks. So I say 10 million. In fact, they attribute this to Stalin. We don't know if he actually said it, but it's attributed to him. What is it? One death is a tragedy. A million is a statistic. That's what happens. So when I tell you tens of millions... You know, it it doesn't doesn't do much, which is it's a frightening thing when you think about it. That that number doesn't do much. You know how many people, how many families have been ruined by that man, and yet, folks, uh, he is considered the most popular Russian. He was actually Georgian. Uh, there's a country named Georgia, Gruzia, but uh, he became the Russian and or Soviet leader. Soviet Union contained Russia and many other countries like the Russian Empire. But you in Bulgaria, you had a terrible communist dictatorship. People had no, no freedom. I was there then. I was there when it was communist. And, and, and I find it amazing. Do people in Bulgaria, you ask the question, people in Bulgaria not know their own history about Todor Zhivkov and, 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 the, and the rest of those guys, Dmitry Dimitrov? It, it's... You know what I'm starting to realize? This is a dark view, I admit it. But there's a lot of darkness in the world. I have a feeling that God looks on earth and sort of says, you know what, I'm really living Groundhog Day. Every generation does the same stupid thing the previous one did. And I, you know, I wonder if God at a given point may just, you know, make up, maybe he takes up some hobbies. Because... It, it maybe get boring watching us people do the same thing every generation. How did people not learn about socialism and communism from the past? I don't understand. It's mind blowing. It's ignorance. It's got to be, they don't know or they think, oh, we'll do it right this time. There is no right socialism or right communism. It's devastating. Individual liberty is the is the best idea. That's the quintessential American idea. It's why I'm in love with the American idea. And I, it's good for the whole world, which I wrote in another book, Still the Best Hope, the, about American leftist and Islamist ideas. So I, it's, it's amazing that you would write to me from Bulgaria at 31, gee, the people don't know what how bad socialism and communism are. Well, you know why? Because people don't yearn to be free. That's why. They yearn to be taken care of. Freedom is a value, not an instinct. Okie dokie. Ajay, if that is pronounced correctly, A-J-A-Y, 17 years old, Dorset, England. Hi, Dennis. Notice a lot of these are from around the world, and this is watched around the world, and that why shouldn't it be? I've always said, if what I have to say is relevant, it's relevant to everybody. It can't just be relevant to Americans. Hi, Dennis. Do you think Islam can undergo a reformation under the work of Imam Muhammad Tawhidi and others? Thanks, Dennis, and God bless. Well, I think that that Imam and Zudi Jasser, another great Muslim in Arizona, doctor, I think that some, uh, particularly American Muslims, because America is the land of the free until the left takes over, and I don't mean that as a cute comment, it's just true. Leftism has never valued freedom. It values equality, and when you enforce equality, you end freedom. By equality, I mean, of course, equality of result, which is what they want. We should all, all be equal. Nobody should have a bigger house than somebody else. Anyway, uh, yes, this is what I believe is possible. And it's very simple. 
this is what is there is one overwhelming thing necessary in Islam for people to drop the idea that society should be governed by Sharia law. Sharia is Islamic religious law. If you wish to govern your life by Sharia, that's fine. That's that's your business. But that society, it's not compatible with liberty. It just can't be. You can't you can't have that. Then there could be a reformation if that would happen. But we're a long ways away from that. Josh 29 in New Zealand. Hi, Dennis. In Fireside Chat, episode 79. I love that. They have numbers. That's great. You gave the opinion that the love of your spouse should be earned. But as a Christian, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Ephesians 5.25 Isn't God's love for the church and the world, John 3.16, unconditional? You know what? I need to do an opening on unconditional love. I, I don't believe in unconditional love, and I think it's a bad idea, in fact. I'll tell you in a nutshell why. Unconditional love means no matter how much bad you do, I will love you. That means that love is the one thing we have separated from morality, which is so bizarre to me. And f- let's just take the, uh, the husband and wife. First of all, by the way, God's love is not unconditional. He, okay, I'm a Jew, you're a Christian, fine. But I know Christianity fairly well, and I know the Bible fairly well. And God... Uh, the, the, the essential Christian doctrine is that you're saved if you believe in Christ, correct? So, so many most Christians have always believed if you don't believe in Christ, you're not saved. So God has made a condition. The condition is acceptance of Christ. How's that unconditional? Is that a fair question? Just that alone, just basic Christian doctrine obviates the notion of unconditional love. God is making a condition. Accept me or accept my son or accept the Trinity or accept Christ, however you wish to put it. There is a condition. And even then, let's say you do accept Christ, but you the, you go on murdering. Then the New Testament itself says, you know, uh, what is it? Faith without works is dead. So, hey, there is some sort of, of condition involved here. And at about husband wife, well, uh, if a if one commits adultery, a divorce is allowed. Correct. So uh, is that unconditional love? Divorce is allowed under that circumstance. Others say as well, if somebody ceases to believe, then you could divorce them as well. But I I'll tell you now, taking it out of religion why it's such a bad idea. If I think my wife will love me, no matter how I act, let's say I just decided to become lazy. You know what? I'm really not in the mood to work anymore, Sue. I'm, I'm just going to you know, stay in bed till noon and then, you know, do my hobbies and have fun and, you know, go golfing with the guys and, you know, I'll see you tonight at midnight. You know, you know, spend the day with the guys and go to a movie and go to a bar and do that regularly. That's, that's, why should she continue to love me? (laughs) I don't know. What what is there to love about me? Or what if I, or worse, what if I treat, what if I mistreat her? Why should she continue to love me? Should a battered spouse continue to love his or her spouse? I don't like the idea that you can never be fired. Uh, In work, if you could never be fired, would you do as good a job as if you know you might be fired if you don't do a good job? Of course not. Everybody does a better job knowing they could be fired. That's the way, and that's the way it should be. Does a football player, what if you said to a football player, you know what, no matter how you play, you're on the team. You're going to get a salary. Think this guy's going to play as hard? Of course not. What animates him, among other things like desire to win, his his uh, you know his his teammates, 
uh, a whole whole ego is also, I don't want to get fired. I want to be rehired and, and play on this team. So if you could never be fired as a spouse, that's my case, my moral case for divorce. Divorce is being fired, as it were. No matter what, I will stay with you. No matter how awfully you act, why is that moral? Why is that loving? Why is that productive? Okay? People don't talk like this because they, they, people have I, what, I, what I would call romantic views of life. Oh, no matter what, we'll stick together. Yeah, but ironically, that doesn't produce a romantic relationship. That's the irony. I need to earn my wife's love every single day. I, I believe that. I truly, truly believe that. I wake up and it's I'm, I want to treat my wife as best as possible. Good, by golly, I want her to continue to love me. Why is that bad? Why is that worse than, hey, she's got me no matter how I act? I don't see it. What's our time frame? 31. Do I know my mental uh, clock? These are really important things. I should talk about divorce. I should talk about unconditional love again and again. I, you know what my favorite verb is? It's not love. My favorite verb, and I love love, let me tell you. I got kids, I got grandkids, I got friends. I got a lot of love in my life, and I give a lot of love in my life. But my favorite verb is earn. Sad part is, a lot of languages do not have a verb earn. It's another thing I should... Let, let me talk about my favorite verb one time. Well, anyway, so how was uh, Otto today? By the way, I, I want you to know, we're all touched at how many of you ask about Otto. I, I meet people at the airport. Can I have a selfie? And then they go, hey, say hello to Otto. So Otto... Uh, oh, my God. Not looking great today. Not a distinguished look. But he didn't snore. Softly. Didn't snore what? It was soft. He Oh, he didn't snore loudly. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right, anyway, I'm Dennis Prager, and from me to you... Oh, you know what? By the way, I, should, I, I feel I need to tell you because this is, the, this is my passion. So this just came out, The Rational Bible, Volume 2, Genesis. And I got my wisdom from this book. This explains the most important book ever written. Even if you're an atheist, I promise it'll change your life. The Rational Bible. If you're in America, by the way, it's at Costco. And I want to thank them for ordering it, because not often that you get a Bible commentary at a Costco. And for those of you around the world, it's easy to order, of course, online. Anyway, again, thanks a lot. See you next week. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to keep these fireside chats free, please do by donating to PragerU.